All right. Uh, let me bless you. Let me bless you as we get going. I bless you in the name of Jesus, that you would know Jesus more wonderfully. I bless you to receive healing if you need healing in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit. I bless you to know the guidance of God, to know God's help in this time, to flourish and prevail over whatever challenges you're facing right now, and that you would feel hope and joy and love and peace, whatever your circumstances, that you would have all of this from God Most High. In the name of Jesus, may it be. B. May it be. <clears throat> All right. Welcome back to our Jesus series where we're talking about Jesus, where we're talking about what it is to believe in Jesus, and we're talking about what it is to follow Jesus. Now, in case you haven't picked this up here at Rehope, we, we have been dialed into what we feel like is God's special emphasis priority here for all of our locations in Glasgow. We, we believe since November that God is putting a strong emphasis in, when it comes to strategy and uh, planning, also kind of strategy, and finances and training in these two areas. Telling people about Jesus and kindness. Two special emphasis that we, I mean, always good things, but in this season particularly important. And so we're going to be talking about kindness today. We're going to be talking about the kindness of Jesus today and, and, our, and our imitation of Jesus' kindness. But before we get very far into this, the, the, sim the first question that I have for us tonight is, what is Jesus like? Now, you're like, Brian, you gave it away. You're going to say he's kind. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he's kind, definitely, at times, but isn't he also blunt at some times? Uh, he's super gracious, you know, at, at times, but he also seems to be super frustrated at times. Frustrated, which my mentor tells me is a, a, a Christian word for anger. <laughs> uh, just kind of toning it down a little bit. It's the same thing. But he seems really angry and, and frustrated at times. If I was to make a declaration up here, like my first draft of this message said, <laughs> and like, Jesus is kind, you know, I think we're not quite being honest with, with, with all of it all. He definitely, though, is kind at, at times, but it depends kind of how, who comes to Jesus but maybe not that as much as how whoever comes to Jesus comes to Jesus. How they come to Jesus seems to determine his response to them. Be it more frustrated or be it more, more kind and compassionate, slow to anger and all that sort of a thing. I mean, you could think of you see, uh, different stories like in the Bible of, of people uh, who think they know more about what the Bible says than Jesus... And they think that their opinion of what's right and appropriate is more important than Jesus' opinion with what's right and appropriate. And they have conversations with Jesus, and Jesus is direct to them. He, he's, he's straight to the point with them. I think, just as a side note, our generation struggles with this. That there are many people in our generation that think their views of what right and wrong ought to be, what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate, is more important than Jesus's. And I just think caution, uh, no, more than caution, red flag, <laughs> warning, warning, warning. Or as followers of Jesus, it's his, it's his declaration, not ours. That was his issue in Jesus' day to our day as well. But as we come to Jesus, uh, Jesus is able to be, depending on how we come to him, he's able to be kind and patient. He's very eager to be kind and patient with us. What is Jesus like? Well, Jesus is like what God is like. Obviously, he is the image of the invisible God. He is with, was with God and was God, is God. So what is God like? One of my favorite descriptions of God uh, in the Old Testament is in Psalm 18. I mean, it's in my top 100 des descriptions. I love this one. There's a lot, though, of good ones. And this is what it says about God, what it describes God. It says, with the faithful, you prove yourself faithful. With the blameless, you prove yourself blameless. 
With the pure, you prove yourself pure. But with the crooked, you prove yourself shrewd. For you rescue an oppressed people, but you humble those with haughty or arrogant eyes. Uh, what's God like? Well, he is who he is, but your experience of God is going to very much depend on your heart posture as you come to God. Very much how you approach God. Uh, what I want to talk about today is how you can and we can experience God's kindness and compassion and grace as we come before him, as opposed to things like maybe his frustration or his discipline. God very much does discipline those he loves. I, I, if I get the choice, I would prefer God's kindness exuding in my direction, and, I, and I, I know that you would prefer that as well. So the questions that I have today are revolving around this idea of how can we experience a life day-to-day where we keep getting Jesus' kindness poured all over us? How do, we, how do we get Jesus' kindness as we go to him and not his frustration? Is it, three questions, is it as simple as being a Christian? Is that, is that what it takes to receive God's kindness? That is a great place to start, for sure. Highly recommend giving your life to Jesus and, and, and all of that sort of a thing. But, if we're honest, it is not the only criteria that sets you up for, for kindness. They, they, Jesus can be frustrated with his people. He can discipline those he loves. If you're thinking through the Bible, you might look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter five, I think, in Acts chapter five, and, and they lie to the Holy Spirit and to the leaders there, and God strikes them dead because they lied. Now, um, that, that's, that's just God disciplining them in that, in that moment. They, they are so appalled at that story that it's just shaking them. <laughs> but if you don't like that story, like in Corinthians, where, where God, uh, it says that believers were, were falling asleep, which is super Bible code word for dying, uh, were falling asleep uh, connected to how they were treating one another and communion and, and all of that sort of stuff. But there's discipline going on for believers and so just because you're, you're, you've given your life to Jesus um, doesn't mean that your day-to-day, -day, every moment experience is going to be just God's kindness. You might uh, experience some of his discipline, which is out of love, and it's to get us back on track, and it's for good reasons. But I'm kind of ready and, and wanting to experience just kindness, you know. So more than just a Christian, there's something else there. How about if I'm just, an, uh, I'm so hungry for the word of God. Like I can't get enough of it. I love, I want to know everything about God. I want to study him. I want to read every book of the Bible um, in my Bible read-through group um, every year for the rest of my life and, and beyond. I want to read every book of the Bible. I want to read books about every book of the Bible. I want to read books about books about the Bible. I mean, I, I just want to, I just want to be, live this life where I'm just so hungry. I mean, honestly, that's how I want to live. I want to live with this Psalm 119, like, inexhaustible passion for God's Word. Like, I, I, I just crave it, and I, and, I, and I love that. But, you know, that kind of heart, is that, is that what it takes to experience God's kindness towards us every day? Maybe. It's, hell, it's great, but, but, but also may, maybe not. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who love the Bible, who study it so deeply, and are punks. <laughs> and are just punks. You know, every once in a while, people come to me and say, oh, Brian, I want to go to Bible college. I want to go, I want to go study the Bible. I want to go, I want to go, um, you know, learn, learn God's word. I'm like, great, go learn, learn, drink it in. Like, you know, everything, everything, you know, just learn, learn, learn. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Just please don't become a punk. Please. It's amazing. One year of Bible college can take the kindest, never mind. So... Uh, just because we, we love the word of God, we've got to live it. We want to live in, in, in obedience to Jesus and, and, and living out the righteousness of God, the, the lovingness of, of God. Uh, it is a great thing to be someone who's passionate to learn the Bible. But it's not the only thing when it comes to experiencing God's kindness. Okay, so maybe you give your life to Jesus. You, you love his word and you, you read it and you, and you go for it. You're, you're part of a Bible read-through group because, you know, why not? 
And, and thirdly, you're, as well as, you want to spend your life becoming a super good person. Like, morally upright. Like, saying no to sin, not just saying no to sin generally, but you know how it is. You say no to sin, the kind of sin moment, temptation moments, that you really, really want to sin. But, and, and it's like, it takes everything in you and beyond a miraculous work of God, basically, for you to resist and to, to say no to that. Where you're, you're, you're totally dialed in in, in wanting to walk in God's ways and, and holiness and, and godliness. Um, yeah, just morally amazing. Will that help you receive consistently the kind? Surely that's got to help you, right? To, to when you come before Jesus, if you're a really good person. Well, it's not, I highly recommend that as well. Big fan uh, of walking in godliness. But also I want to remor- remind you of some of the strong warnings in the New Testament connected to believers who start assuming that Jesus feels great about them because they are, they are morally doing a good job. And, and there's a little bit of twisting there. If, if you're reading in the Bible read-through group this week, Galatians. We're in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, where there is a very strong call out for the Galatians church who started following Jesus. Just It's grace. It's Jesus' grace only. But then things started to get twisted, and they started to think that their behavior would be a part of determining how God feels about them. And this is a very dangerous thing either way, for good or for bad. And uh, Jesus uh, spoke to me very clearly about this in Athens in 2012. I I just love saying it was in Athens because, uh, never mind. So uh, in Athens in 2012, and, and and I just had this time with Jesus where Jesus was like asking me, Brian, why are you worthy? This idea of why do you feel confident that I'm going to be responding to you positively? And I know the right answer, but it was like these these true, deep down heart answers were kind of ripped out of my heart. And I couldn't stop them from being exposed. And these little subtle things went by, well, you know, I mean, yeah... I think that it's probably going to be a positive experience meeting with you right now, Jesus, because, you know, I'm kind of a pastor, <laughs> kind of a missionary, and, you know, I just try and do good. I've never murdered anybody ever, and, you know, just got a list of, of, of behavior-oriented things that, that were giving me some sort of, of confidence at some level that Jesus is going to respond positive to me, and I want to just remind you that is a false hope, that is a twisted gospel. My behavior, no matter how good I am, and also praise God, no matter how messed up I've been, does not determine Jesus' response to me day to day. It doesn't determine whether he's going to be kind to me today. It's not based on my behavior. It's based on my posture as I come before him, whether it's a good day or a bad day. Some people avoid Jesus when they're having a bad time and they know that they're walking out of step with Jesus. That is the same false gospel as if being out of step means rejection from Jesus. It's not the behavior, it's the posture. Jesus, I come before you. And what is the right posture then to come before Jesus? Well, the right posture is to come before Jesus in faith, raw and real. Raw and real. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian at all, come to Jesus in faith, raw and real. It, it, whether you love God's word and you read it and, or you've never read it in your life, coming to Jesus in faith, raw or real. Whether, whether you're a morally good person or a morally despicable person, I don't know. Uh, like you, you come to Jesus, if you come to Jesus in faith, raw and real, how you come to Jesus is the determiner about his response to you. There is a kind, gracious, joyful response to anyone, no matter how their day or year or life has been going, if they will just come to him in a genuine, in faith, raw, real way. Raw and real, that's um, uh, that's, that's another way of saying with bold honesty, total transparency, wholehearted humility. Just, Just here I am. The real me. 
the real me. Now, there's so many in the uh, examples in the Bible connected to this. And I like the variety that we could have looked at today. We could have looked at Peter. You know, Peter's kind of a big deal. A disciple, an apostle of Jesus. He, he's, he writes a couple books. What, what should I name this book? First Peter. You know, <laughs> you know he, he's got some books in the Bible. Uh, obviously, you know who Peter is. Peter, as a disciple, in John chapter 21, has this beautiful, gracious, kind encounter with Jesus after he had totally blown it, after he had denied Jesus, after he had failed in, in that way, and, and, he, and Jesus comes to him and restores him. We could talk about Peter, who knew Jesus and walked with Jesus, but, 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 but failed there in that time. On the other end of the spectrum, we could talk about the woman caught in adultery. And what's intriguing about the woman caught in adultery, she, she's drug out by these accusers and um, these highly judgy people who want to stone her to death. And, and says, Jesus, what should we do? And Jesus saves her from the judgy people um, and, and, and is very kind and gracious to this woman. But this woman is like the opposite of Peter. There is no record of any acknowledgement that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Any acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior. He, she doesn't have any faith uh, expression at all in the story. As, as far apart as you can be on this record, somebody who just, I was just caught in adultery just now, and, uh, and I'm drug out before Jesus to Peter who's walked with Jesus for years. Like, both of them receive these amazing kind responses to Jesus. And, and I, I could just go on and on. But again, the point is, it doesn't matter your current behavior as much as your current posture. The story I want to talk about when it comes to the kindness of Jesus, kindness to those who fall badly, kindness to good people, kindness to those who don't know him, kindness to those who do know him as, as long as they, they come before him in faith, raw and real. I want to look at Luke chapter 7. And in Luke chapter 7, uh, we read this story starting in verse 36. It says, then one of the Pharisees invited him, Jesus, to eat with him, Simon. We, we're going to find out that this Pharisee's name is Simon. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them, and anointing them with perfume. Now that sounds disturbing and disgusting. But, but, it, but this is the most beautiful, one of the most faith moments in, in the New Testament. This moment, this moment, this woman is declaring that she believes Jesus is the son of Yahweh where she can be forgiven. How in the world do you see that, Brian? Okay, so I told you a few uh, weeks ago that every girl between age 5 and 12 were to memorize three books of the Bible. Leviticus, because, you know, that's fun. And, and then Deuteronomy and all of the Psalms. Well, even if you don't get very far in the Psalms, you're going to get to Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2, this is what this girl has memorized, and this is what this girl is applying to Jesus here at this moment. It says in Psalm 2, verse 12, kiss, kiss the son. The son, what, the son? The son of Yahweh, verse 11, verse 10. Kiss the son, kiss the son of Yahweh, or he will be angry, and you will perish in your rebellion. And she's like, I'm a sinful woman. I don't want to perish in my rebellion. Here I am at the feet of Jesus, kissing his feet, applying Psalm 2, which I've memorized. I believe Jesus is the son of Yahweh. It is this incredible coming to Jesus in faith moment. And, and what does Jesus respond to this woman who comes to him in faith? 
in faith, he responds so kindly, with, with so kindly, with so much kindness. There's something about having this view of Jesus as this woman has, where she is not kept away from Jesus by her behavior, but she comes before him in faith, raw and real. Some of you perceive God based on your behavior like, like, like God just wants to zap you. God just wants to zap you uh, because, because of what's going on. But, but God has so much compassion for you. He gets you. He sees you. He grieves about, about you. And his arms are wide open to show you his kindness no matter what if, if you will come to him in faith. You will find grace and forgiveness. The woman does this. But then check this, the next verse. When the Pharisee who had invited him, Simon, when, it, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if Jesus, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She She's a sinner. She, she's a sinner. And that's the wonderful thing I love about Jesus. He knows. He knows she's a sinner. And this is his response. He, he, he's, not, he's not appalled by the fact that she's a sinner. He's delighted in her posture as she comes forward in faith, raw and real, coming to the one so that she doesn't perish in her rebellion. I, I'm so encouraged by his kindness. Jesus doesn't respond like this, this other guy Simon does. And, and instead he's, he's so kind to her. And he says this in verse 48. Your sins are forgiven, he says to the woman. Because she comes in faith. And then in verse 50, he's, and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. If you're reading the passage and you're like, What's the faith? The faith is a Psalm 2 faith which we just talked about. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. I just think this is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is someone approaching Jesus in, in faith, raw and real, and receiving kindness. Receiving grace. Receiving forgiveness. Receiving mercy. I love it. Now, friends, Jesus is so kind. He's so, he's so full of compassion for you. When, you. when you come to him in faith, not doubting based on behavior, but when you're coming to him in faith, whether you failed or messed up or whatever, his natural response to you if, you, if you come to him raw and real, is not head-shaking disappointment, but glorious kindness, glorious welcome, uh, gloriously declaring to you, your sins are long forgiven. Your sins are long forgiven. And he says to you who come to him in faith, your faith has saved you. And he says to you, go in peace, not go in guilt, not go in shame. Go in peace. We're good. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. We're good. What a relief. It would be so hard for us to, to believe this about Jesus. I mean, you know your story. You know, you know what's going on. And you know the kind of forgiveness that is, is constantly needed in, in your life. And yet, if you just constantly keep coming to Jesus, you will find him kind. You will find him gracious full of compassion for you. So that's the sinful woman. Um, but there's this other guy. There's this uh, Pharisee, Simon. He's this Bible guy, right? He's got the entirety of the Old Testament, no doubt, memorized. He's obsessed with being morally good and upright. He, he, he is, he's probably never had chocolate in his life, right? No, just, he's so obsessed with, with the right thing all the time. Did they have chocolate back then? They did. They had chocolate in first century. Phew. No wonder Jesus was like, I'm going to Israel where there's chocolate. Let's get back to this. 
So he says that in verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, we, we read this, he said to himself, if this, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon. Now I told you his name is Simon. Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Let's just substitute huge pile of cash. Owed 500 huge piles of cash and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins, not, not, not just her sins, like, we're, we're going to be clear here, her many sins, and she has many, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. It's not that Jesus is harsh with Simon, the, the Pharisee here. It's not like there's a great contrast, like he's really harsh to him and really kind to this girl. But what Jesus wants Simon to do, though, is he wants Simon to see this sinful woman through his eyes. I want you to look at this situation through my eyes. I want you to understand my heart, my heart. Simon looks at this woman and he judges her as, it, this, as this horribly sinful woman. And Jesus is like, no, I want you to see through my eyes that, that this is, Jesus is not looking at this woman as someone who's trying to judge somebody, whether they're a good person or not. Jesus is like, don't, I'm not looking to, to judge people. I'm looking through the eyes of how they came to me today. Their posture today. She might have been the most sinful person yesterday, this morning, the, all of her life. But today her posture is perfect and I forgive her. And I'm being kind to her, and I'm great. she's receiving my grace, but she came to me in faith with the right posture today. Again, we just often just get so confused, and we think that our behavior determines how Jesus is thinking about us. But it's our posture, our heart posture. We come to him honestly, humbly, in faith. Now, just, just so we're clear about Jesus... Jesus is so clear that he is not come to judge people, okay? He says this in John chapter 12. He says it this clearly. He says, if anyone hears my, my words, if anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, like I'm, I'm telling you stuff, if you don't do what I say, I do not judge him. That's Jesus. If you just don't do what I say, I don't judge you. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, before you get super giddy, uh, Jesus does talk a lot about judgment day, the day that we will have to give an account. Jesus does say in the very next verse, my words that I have spoken will be judged against you. But, but Jesus himself, his posture towards you, he's not looking for, to judge based on behavior or mess up. You're going to have to give an account, but that's not Jesus' posture towards you. His is one of kindness. He hopes to show you compassion. He shows, hopes to show you his grace. Now, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if we had a world full of people like Jesus? Had a world full of people who were kind 
to those who have totally messed up, who were determined not to be judging people, but to, but to seeing how they're responding in that moment. Are they responding raw and real and in faith and, 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 and humble? Are people who are out to show compassion, who are out to show love, who are, feel sorrow, not, not um, judginess, when, people, when they see people suffering or stuck or, or broken, wouldn't, wouldn't that be amazing if there was a whole world full of people like this? Jesus thinks so too. That's, that, welcome to Team Jesus. Right? This is, what, this is, what, he's, this is, what, this is the, what the family's job is. We're part of the family of Jesus, the, the family that's supposed to be following the example of Jesus. Jesus who makes it clear, I'm not out to judge people. And he also tells you, just in case you didn't pick that up, he's like, don't judge. Matthew 7, I think it's one of those most quoted verses in the Bible. Judge not, lest ye be judged. You know, so, something like that. Like, don't, don't, don't judge, don't, don't judge. And, and um, <clears throat> yeah, Jesus just teaches this because he, he wants his people to be like him. Eager for kindness, compassionate, humble, humble. Now this is, now I'm going to say this is very important to God. This is not just kind of important to God. This is extremely important to Jesus. In fact, some of his strongest words are connected to his followers not judging people. His followers being people who are quick to forgive. Like he says so much about prayer, about the connection. With, because we've been forgiven, we need to be forgiving people. Our posture of grace, having received grace, our posture of kindness, having received kindness. I was going to tell you a terrifying parable right now in Matthew chapter 18, but I, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You, you can have that fun later if you want to, but it's the parable about a king who forgives the massive debt of one of his servants because the servant begged him to. But then that servant went out and found his servant, who owed him a little bit, and he choked him, and he was angry, and he threw his servant in jail until he could pay back everything. And when the king found out, the king was furious that he had shown grace to his servant, but his servant didn't show grace to his. And so he took that servant and he threw him in jail and, 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 and was very angry. It's one of those parables that's supposed to remind us God takes our response to his grace with extreme emotional seriousness. The word in that parable is he's angry because th that, that grace that he passed, that the, way, the kindness that he expressed isn't passed on from those, from those he's expressed it to. There is an ocean of grace for those who run to Jesus whether they know Jesus well or not, whether they've lived well or not, if they come to him in faith, raw, real, humble, honest, but also there is frustration. There's frustration, which is, again, secret code word for anger. Uh, frustration for those who just won't be kind, who just won't be gracious, who won't be forgiving. Those who God has given so much to. To follow Jesus isn't just to receive God's kindness, but to be on mission to display his kindness, to give his kindness. If I was going to sum up this whole message in a single verse, Ryan, why didn't you just start here? I would use Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be Kind. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you you in Christ. That's what our family is about. That's what our family is trying to do. So let's try that. Here's the challenge for today. To, 
who do you know? Who do you know that could use undeserved kindness? Undeserved kindness, compassion, uh, and grace these days. Write down their name and come up with a way to extend kindness to them, compassion to them, grace to them. Be very practical. Something, re something very obvious. What does it take to show them uh, compassion, kindness, grace? We can do this. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your love. Uh, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that we have access to your kindness and your grace and your mercy on our good days and our bad days. I thank you that it's all about Jesus. God, help us to walk before you perpetually, continually, with humble hearts honest hearts before you, coming before you with faith, completely expectant, no matter how our life's going, to receive mercy and grace in our time of need. And God, fire us up with opportunity after, after opportunity to show your kindness to the people in our lives. Open our eyes so that we can see every opportunity. Open our eyes to see people through Jesus' eyes like Jesus was trying to help Simon. So that we can see with your kindness and love what's really going on. To get past our biases and love people well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.